Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Gardeners of the Galaxy, a podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I am Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. In episode 3 I talked a little bit about houseplants in space and in episode 5 John Kiss mentioned that astronauts love plant experiments and that there are psychological benefits to growing plants in space. So I am thrilled to have Jane Perone on the show today. Jane is the host of the On The Ledge podcast and truly deserves the title Doyen of Houseplants. Thanks for coming on the show today Jane. Very nice to speak to you Emma. So you have you have a regular podcast so you've been talking about houseplants for uh, several years now. Yes, I can't quite believe my podcast has been going for three and a half years. That is completely bizarre, but it appears so. Okay, so so we're going to talk a little bit about plants in space. And I think you know, if you talk about if you think about astronauts, then they're in a confined and sterile space, and they're a long way from Earth. Um, and so it's not surprising that they might miss you know, something natural and look for some green things and stuff like that. And actually, for the last six months here on Earth, we've all been feeling the same way, don't you think? In the pandemic and being locked down and confined. And So have you seen a massive upsurge in interest in houseplants? Definitely a massive surge of interest in houseplants that was already going on, but has been accelerated massively during lockdown. So lots of people who are working at home may have had one or two plants on their desk and suddenly... They've they're sat there on their computer late at night, you know, ordering orchids from the Netherlands or <laughs> Hoyas or yeah, there's been a real, real burst of interest, which is fantastic and it is it's really, really good. Uh, it has had some um unfortunate side effects in terms of plant prices and I'm a bit worried for people who've started a collection this summer and haven't yet experienced a winter with house plants. And that's that would be my worry in space, actually, is that whereas on Earth, obviously making mistakes with houseplants uh, is not the end of the world in that I've got a compost heap that the dead ones can go on. <laughs> I'm worried what I'd do with them in space. Would I have an airlock that I could, you know, <laughs> jettison dead houseplants out of? I'm, I'm sorry, you've got spider mite, you're going out the airlock. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, that would definitely there'll be a few plants going out through the airlock for spider mite and scale right now. Um so yes, that would be that would be a weird one, and you'd be worried about your plants thriving because if leaves start falling off and floating around, that could be potentially it's not, bad. It's not optimal. No, I was just thinking you were talking about you know propagating plants, and and a couple of people have mentioned that that they would take a plant into space that they could propagate from, and I am just thinking because at the moment astronauts don't have you know, um, house plants; they don't have a pet plant. Um, mm. They have plant experiments. But I was just thinking at the point where there's a colony and there's several people up there, you know, are they all going to, you know, they're going to coordinate. Say, so when you come, can you bring me, you know, a spider plant? I desperately need a spider plant. Um, and, the, you know, is Mars just going to be terraformed by spider plants because somebody took one once? And <laughs> you Yes, know. I love that idea. I mean, that that would be the ultimate, you know, your wish list at house plants. You'd, you'd be playing the long game, wouldn't you, though? Yeah. You'd be like, OK, can you please bring me that spider plant three years later? Here it is. Great. Thank you. Be, like, how would you treasure that plant? If it, I mean, people complain about, you know, by having to order plants and wait for plants now. Yeah. Can you imagine that? That would be the suspense would be terrible. The what if they killed time. it on the yeah. way there? I mean, it's, well, it's traumatic to even yeah. think about. <laughs> yes. There'll be a huge trade in things that could be grown from seeds, I think. So, you know, they derive Yeah, that's intact. true. Yeah. I would definitely, I mean, if I was going to Mars, I would definitely take a load of seed with me because yeah. I love growing houseplants from seed. I do an annual sew along on the show to encourage people to do it. And I think it would be, that would be the best thing to do, really. Take a heck of a load of seed with you and see what germinates and what grows and does well. Uh, you know, cacti and succulents, I imagine, would be quite easy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and you, you can grow those from seed uh, easily enough. So, yeah, that, that you, and you could fit, like, you could have a, a small plastic bag with, like, a <laughs> hundred different yeah. uh, varieties or species in there. So that, that would be a really good idea. But it'd be nice to have some greenery too, wouldn't it? Yeah. To, to so, tend yeah. on the way, way there. 
Yeah. Something a bit, yeah. something that wafts in microgravity would be good, and you want the wavy leaves. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was thinking that Hoyas would be good because they are pretty tough. They're sort of semi succulent plants, really, and they're they they are quite low maintenance. My only worry would be with Hoyas that they do flower and they have a lovely scent, so that would waft through mm. the spacecraft, possibly yeah. offsetting. I always imagine spacecrafts to be pretty smelly places. Like, I do. Where yeah. does the where does the stinky air go? Anyway, I'm sure it's all filtered out and it's all fine, but. You'd get this lovely wafting scent. The only trouble with that would be is that when the Hoyas are finished flowering and the little flower stalks fall off, they just they just kind of tumble to the ground. Yeah. And that might be bad. Also, certain Hoyas release huge amounts of nectar like Hoya mm. Kerii. Now, Hoya Kerii's nectar is bright red. And I'm thinking like I'm thinking of a alien or something. Bright red drops of nectar <laughs> floating through the anti-gravity and you're thinking that's going to look bad you're going to think you've cut yourself <laughs> yeah and it's actually just you're going to be hit by very stain you're going to be covered in red stains basically so I, th- I think hoya carry is a bad idea you don't get to change your t-shirt for about six weeks either so you're going to be stuck with that stain <laughs> yeah exactly and it's really sticky and unpleasant mm. yeah i definitely want some kind i think hoyas would be good maybe a hoya that doesn't flower a lot like there's yeah. a really lovely hoya that i own called hoya villosa which has got these incredible it lo- almost looks prehistoric like this kind of a uh, leaf that's a bit like uh, crocodile skin Ooh. and it's sort of softly hairy so you can give it a stroke oh, nice. it doesn't flower very often so that would be a good choice um, because then you wouldn't have the issue of the, the flowers causing problems But yeah. and I also thought about maybe something from the Gesneriad family there's a nice um, you can get these syningias which are called micro syningias which are only I haven't got one to hand but they're like the size of a uh, I don't know, a large conker. Right. And so they're really small. So you can have quite a few of them and they're sort of slow growing. They do flower and they're rather beautiful. So something like that would be quite nice because it would take up a lot of room. I imagine you're going to be tight for space. Yeah. Maybe, so maybe just, some of those. It's sort of like breed an army of sort of micro plants so they could sort of, like, you know, little house plant collectibles for astronauts. So they can have a little cabinet. Yeah. And, and all the tiny, tiny plants. Because, I mean, lithops are very, very small, but they're all sort of kind of boring until they flower. Um, yeah. yeah yeah or you could have or you could have a little sort of one of those kind of picture frame style green walls with lots yeah. of moss and tiny little mm. gizneriads climbing about mm. in it something like that <laughs> a little picture frame green wall that i could sort of have and just occasionally well no, you chance. couldn't spray it with water though how would you keep it no i mean actually the sp- living wall might work quite well because you could have you, you'd be able to sort of have a capillary action thing going on in the in the substrate behind the plant so that might solve the watering issue yeah that's um, true that's yeah. true and i suppose you could have it kind of like under glass on both sides uh yeah that would work that would definitely work i i mean i have to say i think that i would really make a terrible astronaut because i have a really poor inner ear like uh-huh. any kind of spinning around, uh, I'm, I'm vomiting. Oh. I did a parachute jump <laughs> where I d- had the free fall. I was strapped to some geezer doing it. <laughs> I did the free fall and I was so dizzy and sick that it took me like an extra five minutes to come down because he couldn't do this thing where they kind of corkscrew to speed you up. So, um, yeah, I'd make a terrible astronaut. I'd just be constantly sick. So I would definitely need something to look at to make myself myself feel better. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> Anything to focus on. I, I'm, I'm now, you know, sort of thinking, if I'm going to space, perhaps not with Jane. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> separate separate I mean, launch. <laughs> It would be it would be her I'd make a horrendous astronaut, I really would. The the motion sickness, lack of maths understanding, um, and I think I yeah I think I would be useless I'd be really useless. The only thing I would be good at I think would be the isolation, yeah. and I mean I haven't found that side of lockdown too bad. All people sort of saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't go to the pub and I can't go to the. I'm like, it's, it's fine. <laughs> There's yeah. very few things, social things that I've really missed. Yeah, so I think I'd cope with that okay, particularly if I had a couple of plants on yeah. alongside me. So if you. If you could only have one plant in space with you, 
would you choose the Hoyer or would you take something else? That's a good one. I mean, I think the Hoyer would be good. I think the only thing about it might be that would it would it be a disadvantage for it to be slow growing or would it be would you want I would would you want something that was going to like I was thinking that maybe a Swiss cheese plant would be good because you mm. do get when it's growing well you get amazing changes very frequently so you know they're putting out new leaves all the time yeah. and you get this amazing unfurling process of the new leaf so I'm thinking that would be quite nice to watch you do you would need something that would be changing quite frequently as opposed to just sort of sitting there wouldn't you I'd, yeah. I'd want to be seeing development so I think maybe the only thing is, by the end of the, you're going to arrive at Mars and open the door, of, and literally the whole thing is going to be Swiss cheese plant inside because it's, cut, and you're just locked in by the Swiss cheese plant. Um, that would be the downside. But I think maybe a Swiss cheese plant or another smaller. There's some smaller, monstrous species, still with the fenestrated holy leaves yeah. but that are a bit smaller maybe i'd go for one of those i'd want something that's gonna as i say give me something to look at and i can watch the process of a, of a leaf unfurling and uh yeah so maybe that would be preferable to the hoya and you know very unlikely to produce fruit but if it did produce fruit flower mm -hmm. and produce fruit then i'd have that to eat which is i've never tried but apparently no, it's a cross between pineapple and mango or i can't think which fruits yeah, it's cross tropical. between but mm. it's tropical but you have to be very careful with it because unless it's fully ripe um there is stuff in the fruit that is very unpleasant to eat so you've got to wait for it to be fully ripe before you um dive in there but it you know it's it's if you go to markets in south america it's available you know and it's eaten widely as a fruit so yeah. it must be must be good. okay yeah Okay. So that would be fun to try, wouldn't it? You'd want to be having some fresh, fresh fruit. Yeah. Or in space, I think. So that might be an added bonus. And presumably, you could have some really powerful grow lights up there to really, you know. Well. Could you? Would that be allowed? <laughs> um, certainly, on the International Space Station, you're very limited as to the power. Oh um, darn! Well, it's an LED. LEDs. That's not yeah. So much LEDs power. these days make make life a lot easier. Yeah. So yeah. The, so we get more plant experiments these days. How how warm is it on the space station? What temperature are we talking about? Do you think? Um, it's shirt sleeve, so I imagine it's about sort of twenty one, twenty two oh, degrees. Nice. So I have to check, but yeah, but that you see them all, you know, floating around, and they've just got their t shirt on. So so perfect for most house plants then. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, I think that would be that would be a good choice. Yeah, I think maybe I'd go with the Swiss cheese. I mean, variegation, take it or leave it. But yeah. that would be yeah, maybe that would be my my final choice. And uh, and you could the great thing is if it got too big, you could always just hack it back. I was going to say I think you'd have to do some the surreptitious. <laughs> this airlock's going <laughs> to get in a lot of use, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I think you'd have to do some judicious pruning to keep it under control. The other thing I was thinking on the sort of slightly more practical note, I mean, the Swiss cheese plant, yes, it does fruit, but I was thinking that you should be thinking more about edible things to grow. Yeah. And I was getting very, very practical and thinking about things like microgreens. I don't know if they've tried to grow microgreens in space, but that would be good because I'd imagine that a lot of space food is really, really bland and like, you know, coming out of a plastic packet. <laughs> so I was thinking that you should be taking up there a sort of a microgreens kit so that you could have a supplement, something to just sprinkle over that really dull food just to liven it up. So some yeah. coriander microgreens, some fenugreek Ooh. microgreens, something a bit something tasty. fresh and spicy. That would be really, really useful. Wouldn't take up much room. And might make the difference between, yeah. I mean, I love my food. I just, the idea of months and months eating, I mean, maybe they've, maybe space food's pretty good now, but. They, they do say that it is quite good, but it is still, you know, um, made in advance and sort of, you know, months in advance and in a plastic packet and you have to rehydrate it and then heat it up um, and you don't get to cook. And um, you get really stuffy, you get a stuffy head because um, of the lack of gravity so you kind of lose your sense of smell and taste so um, they go through a lot of hot sauce so I think you know anything sort of yes. with a bit of crunch and a bit of flavour um, an intense flavour would be good yeah. During the winter I really crave crunchy spicy salads and so that's what I'd be craving in space and yeah I, so I was thinking microgreens like I say I'd be my main ones would be think coriander fenugreek radish things like that spicy ones yeah 
then I was thinking, could you take a couple of chili plants up there and have some fresh chilies growing? Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, they haven't um, they haven't been grown on the International Space Station yet. Um, they they haven't long had anywhere large enough to grow them, um, and you need, still need one that's quite short. Um, but yeah, that's certainly on the cards over the next couple of years. They're looking to do tomatoes and chilies. Um, and you can get some really quite uh, compact chili varieties that will grow on a windowsill. And actually, interestingly, on the tomato front, um, I haven't yet tried them, but there is, uh, I have heard very good things about a tomato that's available from the Real Seed Company, a wonderful seed company here in the UK called, and I think it's just called House Tomato. And it's a, it's a variety of tomato that's very, very compact and designed to grow on windowsills that's what they need to try to grow in space is this house tomato that um will be very very compact yeah. that would be a good choice yes. um so that would be that'd be nice a nice fresh juicy tomato would be and, a, and chilies and then you could i mean that is salsa right there you know what else <laughs> do you need that would be my that would be my plan and um but if I couldn't manage the tomatoes and chilies, then definitely the microgreens. I think that would be easy because you could have yeah. them growing in that um, uh, that hydroponic stuff. I don't know what they call it, like the hydroponic matting. Yeah. So there wouldn't be any soil floating around, any soil fragments. It'd be very clean and tidy. So yeah, I think microgreens would be great. Yeah, and you'd get that you'd get that changing um, view, wouldn't you, as you watch them grow and then you eat them mm. and then you start another one. So it would be constantly changing and something to, to look after. So yeah, I think that would be good. Tasty. Yeah. I'm still not looking forward to this trip to space though, I have to say. <laughs> I have to say, I don't really um, I don't think I'd make a great astronaut either because I don't like camping and I've just got the idea that you know the International Space Station, it just looks like camping or a giant caravan mm. in space and the plumbing's not that great and as you say it's gonna be a bit whiffy also the knowledge that once you get to your destination it's not really gonna get any better is it <laughs> no i suppose the only motivation is and this is obviously unfortunately um, a growing concern is just the idea that you know we might need an escape route off this planet fairly it, soon yes. so mm. Yeah, that's um, a bit of a dire note to sound, but you know what I mean. It it is a, it is a that's something which we're all um, starting all pondering. to think about. Yes, pondering at this time. <laughs> so let's think of a more positive future because you are working on a book. Tell us about your I book. I'm working on a book. Yes, so I've wanted to write a book about houseplants for a long time, but. I didn't want to redo any other books that I had come across. So my Bible is the the Houseplant Expert by Dr. David Hesseon, which has been a, a multi, multi, multi <laughs> best-selling book. But it, I didn't want to write that kind of book where yeah. it's a very much a sort of a practical guide with here's a picture of a particular species and here's how to grow it. Um, I wanted to tell a different kind of story. And so what I'm doing is called a book called Legends of the Leaf, the story behind 25 iconic house plants and the secrets to making them thrive. So it is to some extent practical, but one of the things that I go on and on about in my podcast is the fact that the best way to understand a plant is to understand where it came from and how it grows in that environment. Yeah. And just the fact that lots of people are unaware of the amazing ways that plants live in the wild and how they have actually reached us. And there's just loads of fascinating stories that are kind of not really that widely known about these plants and also using that to inform a section on each plant that tells you how to look after them. So the idea is I'm going to try to sort of say, well, OK, this is how it lives in the wild. And this these are the three things you need to do in order to make it thrive in your house. Get to know your house plants. And yeah, history. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And um, I'm crowdfunding it, which is interesting, an interesting journey because the book won't happen unless I get 100% of the funding. I'm doing it with a publisher called Unbound. So uh, that's really great. And it's been really, the response so far has been really, really good. And I'm just itching to write the book now. So yeah. please pledge and then I can get <laughs> the book written. It's very exciting, but it is, um, it is, uh, it's a bit nerve wracking as well. I'm also hoping it'll be a very beautiful book in that I'm working with an illustrator called Helen N. Twistle, who is a brilliant illustrator and printmaker. 
And so she's going to be doing 25 original illustrations to go with the copy, which will be lovely as well. So it should be something beautiful to look at as well. Fabulous. Well, the best of luck with that. I will put the links to your podcast, which is called On the Ledge, um, and to the crowdfunder for the book in the show notes for people. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about houseplants in space. Well, it's really good to talk to you, Emma, and um, thank you for having me on your show. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to hear more of my interview with Jane, then sign up to support the show via patreon.com forward slash Gardeners the Galaxy, and you'll get access to the extended episode. I'll add links to Jane's podcast and book crowdfunder in the show notes, which you'll find at theunconventionalgardener.com. I'll be back next week with an interview with Elliot Roth, who recently returned from a trip to the moon on Hawaii. He's going to explain why we should all pack algae when we leave Earth. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control, confirming termination of your signal. We have spoken to the engineering team about the smell you've reported, and they have requested that you try stirring the WC tank. Mission Control out.